Awesome. So thank you all very much for coming, and thanks a lot to Steve for the opportunity. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, this talk was, <laughs> to, was put together to set the record straight, because I think about seven years ago, I just started my job as a full-time digital marketer, and I came down and I thought, okay, well, you know, I've gone from graphic design to digital marketing, so you know, every graphic designer wants to be a digital marketer. So I'm going to show a how-to guide to transition from graphic design into digital marketing, and it was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what I guess uh, this talk is about today is a bit of a personal account of some of the strategic challenges that I faced over my career, and some of the ways that I use design-led thinking to zoom out and go, okay, well. We've got this situation. Uh, what are the potential options that we've got to overcome them? So hopefully it provides a bit of value. Um, let's see. So like many people, I had a bit of a dark patch in my career. Um, and this book literally picked me up, uh, set the record straight, and helped me dust myself off and really push things forward. Uh, it's a really, really good book if you've not read it. It's about a 30 to 40 minute weed read. Um, full of full screen, uh, full page, that's digital marketer in me, isn't it? Full page uh, quotes with kind of insightful uh, images. So it's a nice quick one. One of the best ones that I think helped me out and set the precedent for everything that was to come after was this quote you see on the screen there. Without a goal, it's difficult to score. Uh, because learning digital marketing, there was a lot of scrabbling around trying to work out the best tactical results. And it, exactly the same as Steve's introduction, often a strategic challenge is the biggest way that you can leverage results. So that's kind of what I'm going to go into today. So um, I'm from Web Marketer. It's a, it's a startup. Uh, I started it up in September. Um, and, and so far, it's been going really good. I'm really loving the startup life. Miss a bit of sleep. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's all been a really good journey. So I set it up in September. Uh, I need to be a bit firmer with this clicker. Uh, Miley and then joined me in April, um, about six months later. Um, and in case you didn't pick up from the surname, we're brothers. And we're actually from a tiny little village called Login in Carmarthenshire, uh, which is ironic. I like a good story. And going into digital marketing and being from Login, uh, it worked out quite all right. <laughs> so uh, my skills are in paid social, paid search, conversion rate optimization, and unfortunately falling asleep on trains when I've had a couple too many beers. But we're not here to talk about that today. So uh, <laughs> the transition started from graphic design to digital marketing when I was just as surprised to find out that Jake was on the way as he was. Uh, he's my eldest son, and uh, he was born about uh, eight years ago, almost nine. Um, but the, uh, the thing was that I, would, I was a year into my career after graduating, and my partner, Ang Harad, her university course was four years long up in Northumbria in Newcastle. So I had a few months to become the breadwinner, ready for her to move down heavily pregnant um, and kind of provide a life for my family. So uh, very level-headed, I completely panicked, and I went and asked for a pay rise. <laughs> Um, and interestingly, the response was, uh, it wasn't necessarily a yes or a no, uh, but it was quite an interesting way to kind of say no <laughs> to a graphic designer. Um, because when someone asks you, what, you know, what's the value you bring into the business and what you're all about, helping things communicate better, helping things look better, and actually it's very, very difficult to figure out how things translate into sales. So long story short, I didn't get that pay rise. Um, but it triggered a whole new way of thinking. Um, and bearing in mind, at the time, I was a graphic designer in an in-house marketing team. Uh, and I, before asking this question, I would ask my fellow creatives and marketers for feedback on every design. Is the layout right? Does it look right? Are the words fluffy enough? Are the colors nice? Um, but I came to the realization that I was working in a sales environment. It was a B2B wholesaler. Uh, and I had access to a sales team. So every time I put a design together, I could actually go and ask them how things were selling. And that switch really helped me start to get a gauge on how you can start designing. And rather than looking at things from a creative perspective, you can start to look at things from a, a return on investment perspective. Anyway, I found Google Analytics, and I never looked back from there. Uh, so. Um, Kind of what qualifies me to come here and talk about digital marketing and strategizing and problem solving? 
Um, so I've had a couple of good wins along my career. Um, I was invited by AMD and Asus and PC World to get involved with the national merchandising uh, campaign. So these are some of the die cuts for the graphic cards that you might have seen many moons ago uh, in PC World nationwide. Uh, when I got my first job as a digital marketer, uh, roughly around the time that I delivered the last talk here, um, a year in, the team that I was working with as a digital marketing specialist uh, won the Chartered Institute of Marketing Canmol Awards, the National Award for Wales, twice in a row uh, for the digital work we were doing. And based on uh, my skills and experience, uh, three years later, um, I was reached out to from uh, an advertising agency in, in Swansea specializing in pay-per-click uh, and programmatic, and I was headhunted then into a senior role in an advertising agency in 2014. I don't know why I'm looking there, because my screen's here. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, September 2018, I started up Web Marketer, and my real focus uh, across that kind of transition period was there's a bunch of people over here that kind of look like our clients, how do we help them decide to become our clients? And so this is exactly what we focus on uh, at Web Marketer. Basically, we're trying to take people who uh, are doing what they want to do, um, and that's absolutely fine, because we'll have all found, uh, as digital marketers in the room, that if you sell, 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 and try and ram what you want to say down their throat, it doesn't work. When someone becomes a client, as much as uh, it pains to admit it, it has to be their own idea and it's our job to help them, uh, to give them the decision-making pieces to come to that uh, realization themselves. So, today, I wanna to talk about seven challenges. Um, most of them professional, one of them is a kind of off-the-wall, music-based one, and then seven ways that those problems were solved. So number one, like I said, first one, not professional. When I graduated, um, I joined a metal band in Cardiff, and we had a, a decent following. Um, we were signed to a record label and we were set to go on tour. Uh, but this was around the time that I found out we were pregnant with Jake, so I, uh, I, I left the band. You'll see my picture on the back of the album, but the music video uh, is the other guitarist that joined. Um, but anyway, we, we basically... <laughs> so here's an example of some of the bad decisions we made anyway. You've got uh, Go For Goths and Goths In A Tree. Um, we got invited to do a pilot TV series called uh, Move A Million, and while the contestants, uh, it was a really weird idea actually, people were supposed to move a million pounds worth of stuff off up a cliff with a metal band playing at the top of the cliff when they got there. So, <laughs> anyway, while they were off moving a million pounds worth of stuff up a cliff, we decided to go off and do a really good photo shoot um, that you know, unsurprisingly never went public. But we, when we were gigging in Cardiff, you know, we had no problem getting people to listen to our songs online, but getting people to gigs was another, a completely different problem. Uh, if we were supporting a big name act, we'd have people there, but the problem was convincing them to come to the front when we were playing. Uh, when we were putting on our own gig, it was a completely different situation altogether. Getting people to come to the venue uh, was, what was the challenge. So we knew that there was tons of metal bands out there that was hungry for people to come to their gigs. We also knew that there was an up-and-coming burlesque industry in Cardiff as well that were also looking for people to come to their gigs. So we thought, okay, well, two kind of uh, scenes that were struggling in Cardiff, bring them together, put an event together, um, and see what happens. Every gig we put on was sold out. Uh, because the burlesque acts would go on before every band, rather than a band having to convince people to come from the sides and watch the gig uh, at front row, when a band went on, everyone was at the front ready for, to enjoy their set. So, as far as I was concerned, problem solved. I'm going back, aren't I? <laughs> uh, so, the next challenge is, could my website be generating any more leads? This is a bit of a case study uh, for some of the work that we've been doing since starting up Web Marketer. Now, if you'd have asked me when, I've gra when I'd graduated university, um, which of these buttons looks better, which is better designed, uh, the key uh, piece of advice was that good design is transparent. If it's badly designed, it sticks out. So, are we gonna say that the button on the left or the button on the right is better designed? On the right, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> so, the button on the left is better designed. It blends in with the background, it looks more 
uh, successful, it looks more sophisticated. Exactly as Fran has said, the button on the right is actually better designed because the role of a button is to be clicked. And if you want someone to click something, there's nothing more universal symbolically than a button. And also, color-wise, it stands out on the page and it commands attention. So as part of the conversion rate optimization work that we do, we look for two things first, which is the most visited content on a website. And then we look at that content and see what does that content say about the intent of a user. So are they reading a blog post? If so, can we offer something interesting to download? If they're looking at a service page, they're already a couple of steps towards making a sale. And how can we then convert those people into clients or at least qualified leads? So let's run through the typical form on a website. This is the general anatomy. So we've got, fill in this form, we've got basically a bunch of text that says we're gonna send you loads of marketing emails, and then we say submit. It's quite commanding, and uh, you know I've, I've fallen into this trap many of times before. We're telling people to do what we want them to do, rather than what they want to do. So let's run through a couple of different improvements that we can make. Um, and you can all, all go back and do this on your own websites and see what happens, and I'd be keen to know. So, everything is wrong with this approach. There is literally not one element that on this run-through that I won't change. So, from filling this form, which is something that we want the person reading it to do, we're going to say, get this thing that you want. We're going to add value. Rather than saying that we're going to fill your, e your inbox with emails, we're going to give an idea of the value that's going to be generated from downloading this thing. We're then going to encapsulate the form to make it stand out. The thing that we want them to do, it's so subtle that people won't realize that it stands out more, but it really works. And bearing in mind, this is, this is kind of tactical advice, so the work that we do is a lot more zoomed out, but this is something that you can go home and action straight away. And we can then signpost to navigate the path of the eye from the proposition text through to filling in the form. And finally, we can make the contrast of the button stand out more and then reduce lead friction, so that if we, we don't have to ask people for 17 million pieces of information about their life. All we need is a name and an email address, possibly even just an email address to get in touch. So the two from left to right are completely different. We've, we, it, in, in theory, we've gone from a very selfish approach to much more of a personal approach where we're adding value. And from what we've seen from the work that we've done, um, we work with uh, Jessica Draws, a fantastic illustration agency in Cardiff. Uh, we were able to increase the conversion rate by 1,750%. We were able to increase the frequency of leads that they were getting through their website by almost 500%. And within three months of doing the work, um, they had 171% return on investment. The same for Bishop Grotesque University in Lincoln, who are Again, really dynamic in their approach to, to marketing. They're based up in Lincoln, and they're a challenger university. So within 30 days, uh, we'd benchmarked 77 leads a month. We'd driven 131. And in 14 days, we generated 14 open day signups, which is just about the most valuable thing that you can do on a website. And all with zero pounds worth of ad spend. We were making their marketing money work much more efficiently. So, next example is how do we improve the quality of our leads? Who's, uh, so, from, from my university days, we know that good, university, good, good designers always ask why. Uh, it's a trait, like don't take anything at face value, there's always a better way of doing something. And who recognizes this quote? So, when you're designing a website, design it for mobile first and then desktop. Everyone familiar with that? Cool. So, it's not always true, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, Never, never uh, take an average at face value, and it's something that I've learned the hard way over my career. Because absolutely do that if you're working in a environment when you're, where you're working with consumers. B2C, yeah, mobile first, absolutely. But in the B2B environment, uh, these are taken from three random Google Analytics accounts that we have access to, uh, and there's only one that's slightly less than two thirds of, the, of, uh, two -thirds of their traffic that's from a desktop device. So focus on mobile for these guys, and you risk losing high-quality leads. Also, we've got to bear in mind that in a B2B environment, there's a big difference in psychology between using a desktop and using a mobile. If you're at work 
you're more likely to be on a computer in many industries. And I'm not going to fall into the trap of recommending averages. But if we think about in a B2B environment, we're often on a computer. We're leaning forward. We're in work mode. We're more likely to take action. Generally speaking, when we're on a mobile, we're in lean back mode. We're more likely to passively engage with content. Again, not true 100% of the time, but roughly speaking. So in that sense, when you're looking at generating leads in a B2B environment, it's fair to say that one thing that you can test, and again, testing is important, is if you're targeting people on a desktop, test whether those people are more ready to buy and a higher quality lead versus generating cheap leads through a mobile. What you might find is even though it looks like an increase in cost per lead, those guys are going to convert to clients a lot more cost effectively. <laughs> this was one of my favorite ones. So I don't know uh, if anyone in the audience has had this issue as a marketer before. Um, when when uh, you're tasked with something really boring, and I can say this because I was in-house, um, we've got this, we're, we're behind on sales. We've really got to push things forward. How are we going to do this? There's, there's not much you can change about USB drives. Um, there's not really anything that you can say. To my mind, you may have a, we may be able to exercise your creative muscles and come up with a better way. Uh, but we found that we can't really make USB drives exciting. No matter how much we thought about it, there's not much we can do. Um, but when we looked around the industry, we didn't see too many people using animated emails. Um, and after a bit of research, we found that uh, actually animated GIFs could deliver quite well in inboxes. And sure enough, when we started sending out these animated emails, the phone started ringing, not necessarily with sales inquiries, but people who had seen the, the emails and wanted to talk to their account manager about it. And naturally, this resulted in sales, getting people on an inbound phone. We knew that inbound phone calls generally resulted in 80%, 80% of the time would result in a sale. So this ended up being a really good approach. And we tested it a few times, and each time it had the same effect. And this kind of thinking, like, like if you think back to when I was talking about looking at design from a creative perspective and switching to a sales perspective, uh, if we want to think about how we can launch a product better, you'll probably have heard the saying before, there's always three sides to a story, their side, your side, and the truth. Um, actually, what you tend to find is that the customer generally knows the truth. So if you ask the customer, that's generally where you're going to get quickest to the results. And we have a, a phrase that we like to, to bound around, um, and we've seen bounded around a lot, which is walk a mile in your customer's shoes. Because honestly, we found that time and time again, that leads you to the biggest results. Um, so again, interestingly enough, a hard drive, not particularly fun. But after we uh, did an exercise speaking to clients to find out what would make them buy a hard drive, or more importantly, considering we were B2B, what would make people buy a hard drive when it was on the shelf? One of the things was that it had to stand out on the shelf. So first off, we made all of our sales literature very obviously stand out. Every uh, hard drive packaging where you saw kind of uh, toned down reds and blues on hard drive packaging, ours were black with a pop of color, and the, the hard drives actually had a UV spot varnish, so they shined as you walked past them. We also uh, created quite swanky sales literature that had all the specs so that we knew that B2B audiences, they generally tend to know what they want. So if you're just up front with all the information, we found that when we spoke, uh, we'd find out pretty quickly if they were interested to buy. And then finally, one of our key uh, clients came up with this strap, strap line, which is back the F up, um, F, <laughs> F drive being a hard drive. Um, but although it sounds kind of cheesy, that story of being able to say that one of our clients came up with the strap line was an amazing sales tool. And before the product, product was even ready to launch, the sales team went out with, mar with sales literature. And off the very first phone call, 300 units were bought. And I really strongly believe that that wasn't necessarily down to the quality of the marketing. It was more down to involving the customers in that product development um, process. They were invested in the product when it was launched. So um, the second final point is uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, I don't know if anyone's found it before, uh, where you put months into putting a website together and it completely consumes your world and you're really, really happy with it when it's finished. Um, 
but you kind of know that when you go, we just launched this website that I'm really proud of, no one really cares because that doesn't really fit into their world. <laughs> so I was really happy that I'd taken the Visit Swansea Bay website from something that looked like it belonged in the 90s to a modern day website with the help of, uh, of a Cardiff web design agency. But I knew that when I went to social media, even though we had a really big social media following, that it was gonna drop like a lead balloon. So we thought long and hard about what could we do to make people care about the fact that we just launched a website. Now, bearing in mind, I had the, uh, the lucky experience of being responsible for social media listening twice in a row when Rosili Bay Beach got announced as one of the best beaches in the world. Um, it was fun, but it meant I literally spent a day on Hootsuite looking for, <laughs> looking for tweets coming in and responding and pointing people to the website. But we used that to our advantage. And instead of going live and saying, hey, we just launched a website, we used that, we used that and said, uh, we're running a competition uh, we'll select someone at random to spend seven days with Britain's best, best beach as their front garden. Uh, worked pretty well. Uh, we had about 20,000 visits just off of a seven-day uh, seven campaign um, and an extra 4,000 people onto our mailing list. Just again from flipping that thinking to we're going to go out and be selfish and tell some, some people stuff that, we, that they don't really care about and thinking about something that really would matter to them. And the final piece then was as part of the Visit Swansea Bay website, uh, we would have to uh, sell advertising for people to, to feature on the, on the, on the site. Um, it's a very well visited website, so having a profile page on, on the site was really valuable. Uh, we also built in with the new build that people could, uh, we could sponsor search results. So when they were searching for specific things in specific areas, the businesses that were promoting the sales would come up top. Um, and also we could add people to homepage features. But time and time again, the most valuable thing that, that people were interested in was the email sponsorship. So that led us to really think hard about, well, if people are buying in from the email sponsorship, there'd be uproar if we put our prices up. So how can we generate more sales? Um, and for us, that was growing the email list. People like email sponsorship, so how do we get more people on the email list so we can get businesses in front of them? Now, again, we zoomed out and thought, okay, well, what do the visitors to the website like? We knew that the majority of people were searching for things to do in the area, and we knew that walking indexed at something like 85% or 95% of what people did when they came. So things to do combined with walking being right up there, we completely built out the, the walking section of the, the website. We made uh, all walking routes available in all different destinations. And when people show that they were interested by looking at a specific walking route, we showed them an opportunity to download the walking route PDF, which were previously available via a PDF link. Uh, and it worked pretty well. Um, whereas the website was generating 1,200 leads a year, we flipped that up to 35,000 emails in the first 12 months. So again, dramatic effects just by putting yourself in the customer's shoes from, from what I found. So a little bit of a, a summation. So again, it's a personal account. I'm not gonna say it's gonna work every time, but this is definitely what I found over time and some of the tools that I, I used. So the first issue was attracting more people to get off of the sofa and come to an event. We used strategic partnerships to, to add leverage. Generating more leads, we thought about what the customer would want and also involve them in the process. Improving lead quality, we considered the context of how people would engage. So what are they doing when they're seeing our ads? What are they doing when they're visiting the website? If they're on a phone, if they're in a B2B environment, chances are they're commuting. They might not be ready to, to become a lead. But if they're on a desktop, we know that they're in work mode and we know that there's a good chance that they're gonna be ready to have a conversation. How do we promote something boring? Well, maybe you can't change the boring thing but if you know how you're promoting it, you can work with the medium. How do we launch a product? Your customers will tell you. Uh, often a client doesn't know, often the marketing agency doesn't know, but the customer always does. How do we launch a website? We give them something to visit for, not a reason that we want them to visit for. And how do we sell more advertising? Well, if you can't put your prices up, then find a way to increase the value for money. So it's been a pleasure speaking with you guys. Um, hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Louis. Um, in the, because obviously you filled in at the last minute, I don't know if I actually took the time to tell you that there's a bit of a Q&A session at the end.
best friend. Good. <laughs> <laughs> some, like, there have been some speakers in the past that are like just like diving off the stage. <laughs> so, Any questions? Brian, <laughs> Brian you are on. Um, yeah. Uh, can you go into CRO stuff on our website? How mm. do you, when you were saying about like, the design led mm -hmm. approach to tweaking things, yep. how do you deal with the issue of what will probably convert better versus what fits in better with brand, not wanting to damage Brand. Sure. It's a really good question. Um, so basically, what you generally f what you generally find is that uh, websites often really look good, and if they've been designed properly, they have a really good user experience. But what you often find on websites is that it generally gets designed to how the business wants to convey themselves or the information that a business thinks it's Im important. So um, one of the things that we really believe in is again using design-based thinking to zoom out and go what's the key problem on this page um, because sometimes you know adding testimonials isn't what it needs uh, sometimes it could be that there's a lack of awareness sometimes it's that we're not explaining what the product or service is properly um, uh, sometimes that you know um, that it's not clear what the proposition is there's so many different different things that we can look at and if we actually zoom out and go if we were the customer would we convert we like to use um, a rule that's basically that people hit a website and they look for reasons not to convert before they do look to, for reasons to convert. Um, that's basically on the principle that if you look at any website, if you, if you see a conversion rate more than 3%, it's good. Flip that on its head and think that there's 97% of people that aren't going to convert when they visit your website. And rather than celebrating that a 3% is a good conversion rate, we need to give ourselves a kick up the backside and say, well, why is there not 97% of people that's converting? And I'm not saying that it's, it's possible to get to 100%, but sometimes the things that convert customers are the things that people know about, but they seem like such a low priority that they just stay on the bottom of the list until they keep putting them to the bottom of the list and then eventually drop off. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my take on it. <laughs> Any other questions? Brett, you know the, um, I agree that Yeah. I haven't seen it done very often, but could you maybe put it into this, like, have a little box for them in the next stage, because they've kind of got a mini, mini commitment mm -hmm. to that two-stage process here, or...? Yeah, so you are seeing a lot of the time now that you have, like, a multi-stage um, lead generation form, so uh, buttons or check boxes. So uh, exactly as you said, along the line thinking of micro-commitments, so the more times someone clicks or the more times someone does something in interaction with your brand, when they get to that kind of big um, lead friction point, they're more likely to convert. Um, I like to think about it in the sense of like, where are they on the website? If they're on a blog post, chances are they're not really ready to speak to anyone just yet. So the first point is just get them on the email, email list because you can build a relationship over time. If they're like three pages deep in the service pages, chances are you can, you can convert into a lead straight away. But you are always more likely to generate a higher volume of leads through a short, well, I say always, it's, it's generally more likely to generate leads off a, off a short form form. Uh, but yeah, that, there is a question of quality. Uh, and genuine answer is you, you have to test. Look at the number of leads that convert to clients through both.